This morning, we've got a very lachrymose sermon. Anybody know what the word lachrymose means? L-A-C-H-R-Y-M-O-S-E. Lachrymose. Charles is looking at it on the, on the internet. No, no. Stiff? Difficult? Now, it means to do with tears. A lachrymose is tearful. It's like a three-weepy, three-hanky-weepy. Not that we're doing one of those, but we're going to look at Esau's tears. In Hebrews 12, 17, it said that he sought repentance with tears. We're going to have a look at that, but before we do... I'm going to put some really interesting and fascinating facts about tears that you probably never knew before. And then we're going to have a look at what God does with our tears. And then we're going to have a look at why Esau cried. So on average, do you know how, many, how much tears we produce each year? In gallons. Yeah. So anywhere between 15 to 30 gallons of tears are created every year by each and every one of us. And human eyes produce three different kinds of tears. I don't know whether you knew that or not. But there's what's called basal tears. And basal tears are the ones which clean your eye and make sure that it's still kind of working okay. Then there's reflex tears, the kind of things that you do when you, you know, cut in an onion or you get something in your eye. And then there's emotional tears. Now... No other creature on earth produces emotional tears. Only human beings. And although many animals shed tears, emotional tears, tears produced as the result of our feelings are a uniquely human phenomena. Tears are created by the lacrimal glands. And that's why it's lacrimose. Lacrimal glands are the, are the ones that uh, produce it. They're above each eye. And they're dispersed across the eye's surface by blinking, which is why we blink, isn't it? It's to get the tears um, coming through. And they're drained, the tears are drained by holes in the corner of your eyelids. And from there, they're funneled into your nose, and they either evaporate or are reabsorbed and recycled. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? That we get recycled tears um, when, when we're using them. And tears are made of proteins, salt, and hormones. And the biological composition of tears is similar to saliva. However, they have other things included depending on the need of the eye. So you, you, one has to say, well, why have we got tears in the first place? You know, they're inconvenient kind of things. Why do we need tears? Well, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but your front of your eye, the cornea, is the only part of your body that doesn't have any blood vessels. And the reason you don't have blood vessels there is that if you had blood vessels across your cornea, you wouldn't be able to see anything. And so the eye is amazingly created. I mean, our people can say it all evolved from this, that, and the other because it's so complex having it together. But the eye, the cornea, has no blood vessels. And so when you blink, your tears are distributed across the front of the eye, and it does the job of the blood vessels. So it's almost like blood plasma. It has a special oily film around it so that you can see through it when you blink. And it brings, it brings oxygen to your eye cells, and it takes away the carbon dioxide. And if you didn't have tears, your eye would dry up and you wouldn't be able to see. All the cells at the front of your eye would die because of that. And they're needed because they need the cleansing and it, it, it sorts it all out as it goes along. An amazing creation. And tears, as I said, have different constituents. The tears we cry when we're feeling strong emotions, actually the body knows about the, your emotions and your tears have extra hormones and proteins that aren't present when you're just normally doing it. And those proteins and hormones balance up your emotions again. So whether you're excited with joy or whether you're sad because of something you've seen, then those hormones change and your eye helps you restore emotion. Now sometimes you can have irritants in your eyes. So if you're chopping onions, for example, 
that releases something called synpropanethiol S oxide. I want you to remember that because I'll be asking about it at the end. Okay, but it's an irritant, it's a chemical irritant. So you've got a choice. You can either wear goggles or, uh, you know, well do a face mask or something like that to stop it coming through, or you can use tears. And the tears, when they are created, include a special compound which reacts against the irritant. It's a cleansing agent and it's a protecting agent. That's amazing, isn't it? God created that without us having to think about it. And we never really think about it, do we? And do you know, men's tear ducts are larger than women's. Which means that when men cry, their tears are less likely to spill down their faces because they're washed away quicker. And the reason, I don't know if you've ever really cried, you get your nose running. It's because all the tears are coming down fast enough and into your nose, and that's the way it clears as well. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, who thought about that for tears? So simple a thing, and yet God has created it and designed it in such a way that it protects our eyes. And uh, I don't think you've ever yawned really, you know, heavily. Sometimes when you yawn, you cry as well. Because yawning places temporary tension on the eye's glands, causing liquid in the eyes to be unable to drain through the tear ducts. So it comes out of our eyes instead. And I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase crocodile tears. Yeah? Why is it called crocodile tears? They're not real tears. Well, they're not genuine tears. They're not tears of sorrow. And it was actually a, a, a proverb from the, an African tribe that had seen a crocodile eating an animal. And because of its squeezing it, uh, uh, thing, what had happened, it was just, again, causing the pressure against the eyes. And out of its eyes were coming tears. And they said, oh, it's crying because it's eating an animal. So if you ever get crocodiles in Southam, check them out. Look in the River Stowe, see if you can see any there. But it, they would, you know, do that uh, from there. But those tears weren't real. So who cries the most? Is it men or women? Women. <laughs> Arwen. Oh, that's not fair. However, it is, they've done lots of studies on it, um, and although different studies report varying numbers, they all agree that women cry at least twice as much, maybe more, than men. However, interestingly, women who live in Western societies and have got all these great, you know, freedoms and equality and, and what have you, cry more frequently than those who live in th developing countries who are more used to the problems that they, they come under. And here's a fascinating fact. There is one country in the world which never has a tear shed at a funeral. Which country do you think it might be? Not Japan. It's Bali. Bali, people, the part people of Bali never shed a tear at a funeral. And the reason is, Helen, are you listening to this? Okay. The reason is, that they always have the funerals two years after the person had died. So by that time, you've managed your emotions and what have you, and it's a celebration of the people who are alive. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that would be a trend we could start over here from there. But you know, in the Bible, tears are mentioned lots and lots of times. Lots and lots of times. It's not a male-female thing. Males and females actually cry in the Bible. So, you Bible students... Who's the person who has the most recorded times when they cried in the Bible? Who's the person who had the most recorded times in the Bible? Sorry? Jeremiah? No, well, he was the weeping prophet. Well done. Not David. Not Mary. John? No. It's actually Joseph. Joseph cried seven times, according to the Bible, for various reasons. And in a few weeks' time, we're going to be starting the life of Joseph. And James is going to tell you all those times, I'm sure, as we go through, speaking about what happened to Joseph. Seven times. How many times did Jesus cry? 
Three times it was recorded. Yeah, in the garden. He weeps over Jerusalem and he weeps for Lazarus. And if it's okay for Jesus to cry, surely it's okay for us as well. And I want to just think for a few minutes about <laughs> emotional tears, just for a short time this morning, before we get on to um, the tears of Esau. Why is it that we cry when we feel sad? Or what's the reason for it? Why did God create a physical act to coincide with our emotional feelings? And one reason may be for the social aspect that it provides. Think about how difficult pain is when you're alone in it. And tears communicate to others your need for support and love. So in one way, God designing of tears was actually designed born from his care for us. That tears would symbolize I'm hurting to those near us. And if they communicate our pain to those around us, how much more do they communicate our pain to God? Some people think that we feel better if we cry, but actually there's not much scientific evidence for it. What happens is that when we watch a weepy movie or a sad movie, and they've, they've checked all this out uh, from there, we do feel sad at the end of it. And then perhaps if we cry, it feels as though we're feeling better. But actually what we're doing is coming back to the same state, but it's in a quick period. So we feel better of doing that. Um, however, there are other tears that are shed by our emotions. If you've ever watched the Olympics, you'll find that someone now who's won a gold medal seems to burst into tears with joy because that emotion is there and the tears bring it all back into a level kind of emotional state. And for centuries, Christians have called this world the valley of tears. And although Jesus came, although Jesus rose from the dead and he's coming again, we still have to walk in the world which is a sad world. If you re you've only got to watch the news, listen to anything, all you hear is sadness and helplessness. And one of the things that, that tears come out of is not so much sadness or joy, but it's a state of helplessness. I can't do any more than to help people. I'm helpless. And to such mourners, the Bible's message is not to dry up our tears, not to put on a stip up a lip and, and, and sort of not to do anything. The Bible says weeping is typical of life in the valley. And its message to mourners is much more sympathetic, much more steadying. You know, the Bible says that not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from God's notice. And neither does one, a single one of your tears. When Hagar lifted up her voice in the wilderness of Beersheba, God came near because he'd heard her tears. When Hannah wept bitterly outside the temple of the Lord, God noticed and remembered. And when David became weary with moaning, God didn't become weary with listening. And I believe that God let David ring, create a song about tears, and it's in Psalm 56. And let me just read you verses 8 to 11 from the New King James Version. David has got a problem. He's been locked up away in, in captivity. And he's pouring his heart out to God. And he says this in Psalm 56, verse 8. You number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? This psalm says that every tear that David has cried, God has placed in a bottle. Now, whether it's a genuine bottle up there or not, I don't know. But figuratively, there's an intimate, intimate imagery that God is near in our hurt. The God of the universe, hearing millions of prayers at any given time, is aware of every tear 
that leaves your eyes. Let just that sink in for a moment. There is not a tear that has fallen from your eye that God has never seen. Whether you're a small toddler who's fallen over and wants to cry, whether you're a teenager who's got all these angst and, and what have you, maybe you're a, a young adult going into marriage. 56 years ago, there was a couple over there who did that. And now maybe you're old and you've got the anxieties of old age. Not one tear is missing. God is aware of every one of them. And Psalm 56 teaches us that God does not simply dismiss our pain. He doesn't acknowledge it and they say, well, that was interesting and move on. No, he records them. He keeps record. It's personal. It's intimate. It's caring. This is who our God is. He is telling us he is aware of every tear we cry. And God is aware of all our struggles. He's not apathetic to our pain. He's not withdrawing from our confusion, whether it's with sin, anxiety, depression, loneliness, confusion, loss, doubt, any other type of pain we face. He understands. Why? Because Jesus felt the burdens that we feel. That's Hebrews chapter 4, by the way. Read that. You'll see that Jesus is a experienced the same things that we did. Surely Jesus was lonely. Surely he tasted abandonment from God on the cross. Didn't he sense anxiety in the garden when he was sweating blood? Didn't he live day by day with people who doubted who he was and constantly misunderstood him? Didn't he weep at the loss of his friends, Lazarus? In Jesus, we don't have a king so lofty and above our difficulties that he sweeps away our tears with disdain. No, we have a king who has descended into the pain with us. We never cry alone. And the God of all comfort keeps watch over our weeping. He gathers up all our tears and puts them in his bottle. And like a mother sitting beside her child's sickbed, God marks every sigh of discomfort and pain. No matter how much of your anguish has gone unnoticed by others, not one moment has escaped the attention of the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps. And King Hezekiah, when he prays to God, God answers him and he says this. He said, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. That's 2 Kings 20 verse 5. But then, in Hebrews chapter 12, so God is interested in our tears, he knows our tears, he responds to our tears, he records our tears. But then in Hebrews chapter 12, we read of a situation where it seems that God has ignored somebody's tears why well let me just read it to you starting at verse 14 it says this pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Why was it that Esau found no place for repentance, although he sought it carefully with tears? True repentance is not merely regret for one's conduct, but a complete turning from sin and towards God. It involves a right about face, a turnabout, a, 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 a willingness to change one's direction and pursue it totally a different course of action. And as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And repentance is a very important word for the Christian. The Westminster Confession of Faith states that it is of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without repentance. You know, in the 1600s, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle. And the first thesis read this. Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and then there's a few bits, he says, willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. It's therefore of vital importance to the Christian life, and the Bible tells us that if we repent, we shall be forgiven. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's why we pause at the beginning of the communion service for us to check our body, check ourselves, check our spirit and repent uh, of it. But what is repentance? Well, the basic idea is that of turning from sin, that we have a change of heart with regard to our sin and that we make sincere and determined efforts not to repeat that sin. And God accepts such repentance allied to faith in Christ Jesus. So it may come as a surprise then to find that we have in Hebrews 12, 17 an example of someone who seemed to be sincere in repentance and yet was rejected. Esau cries bitter tears and pleads for blessing and yet he has turned away. What does it mean? Does that mean that sometimes God rejects the penitent sinner? Could it be that someone might come to God in genuine sorrow for sin and yet still not be heard. But when we examine these things more closely, we find that the repentance that Esau sought was not the truly godly repentance which God requires. In order to understand this, we need to think a little bit more closely behind the scenes about Hebrews and about Esau. Hebrews chapter 12 was written to encourage the Hebrew Christians to keep going in the midst of great difficulties. They've already been told in chapter 11 that they're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, men and women who kept going in the midst of great adversity as a result of the genuineness of their faith. And then chapter 12 brings them to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, exhorts them to look to him, the author and finisher of faith. The writer then patiently explains to them that the Lord sends trials to chasten them, to discipline us, to train them towards Christian maturity as children of God. Therefore, it's important that they react well to these trials and difficulties, neither showing resentment towards God nor giving up their Christian life. And in the middle of all this exhortation, Esau is held up as an example. Not as an example to follow, as in the cases of the heroes of faith in chapter 11, but as an example to avoid, as one who spurned the grace of God. So to understand this, we must look at Esau's history his character and the nature of his sorrow. And you might recall the story of Esau Esau and his twin brother Jacob in Genesis 25 and 27. Esau is the older brother, although only by a few seconds, and should, according to the local culture, inherit the elder brother birthrights. One day, however, Esau has been out hunting. He's exhausted, famished, and he finds Jacob, his brother, who had been a homely type, had been inside all, all, all morning cooking a delicious stew. And as the wonderful fragrances from the stove reach Esau, he becomes ravenous. Give me some of that, I'm dying of hunger, he says to Jacob. And Jacob indeed offers him a bowl of stew. But he says, I want you to exchange something for it. He said, I want you to give me the birthright. And Esau, not thinking this through, agrees, enjoys his stew, and then forgets about the whole thing. However, a couple of pages further on in Genesis, we find Esau's tears, deep tears of regret, because his father Isaac had wanted some meal, and he'd gone out to catch it, and Jacob comes in, dressed as Esau, and he gets the blessing of Esau. And Esau comes back and says, oh no, I've been twisted out of this and I've been cheated out of that. It's not fair. Give me my blessing. And he cries. He's upset. But his tears aren't repentance. His tears are frustration that he lost his birthright. In fact, in Genesis 25, verse 34, it says, Esau despised his birthright. He got no interest in it whatsoever. You know, what kind of person was Esau? Well, Hebrews describes him as a profane person. The basic meaning of the original word profane means to be outside of the temple, not interested in God, irreligious, irreverent, careless about God. And that's what Esau was. He couldn't care less about God. He couldn't really care less about his birthright. Esau was not seeking a place in the divine plan. He did not see the opportunity that lay in his path for the taking. Little did he realize that this was no ordinary inheritance, or that in in that inheritance lay the destiny, not only of the nation, but of the world. 
Esau could have been an instrument in God's hands. But he didn't seek God or try to work with God. And by giving away the inheritance so lightly, he forfeited what he could have had. You see, the birthright, in his case, was concerned with spiritual blessing and future spiritual blessing at that. The promise had been given to Abraham. He said, I will, God says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing to all nations. According to Hebrews 11, verse 6, this promise was transferred to his descendants. Esau could have had a part in this had he wished. However, he didn't have the faith of Abraham. A faith that looked beyond the present world. A faith which looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Sadly for Esau, his physical appetites were more important than his spiritual privileges. And how many of us are like Esau? It was a serious danger for the Hebrew Christians to whom the epistle was written that preoccupation with this present world was drawing them away from the grace of God. How many of us are like Esau today? Perhaps even in our churches, having the opportunities of eternal life with all its great spiritual privileges and yet spurning it because they love this world and its pleasures. And when the time came for Isaac's blessing upon his firstborn son to take place, Esau missed out because of the trickery of Jacob. He sought a place of repentance. He sought it intensely and sincerely. But what was it that he sought? The Hebrew word, or sorry, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. And it has two meanings. One is a sincere and clear repentance of heart, bringing us back to God. And the second one just means you want to change somebody's mind. And this is what Esau was trying to do. He was trying to change his father's mind as he realized it was too late. But how does that affect us today? Have we followed Esau's example of profanity, not wanting to know about God, seeking to avoid it? Are you more interested in this world and its pleasures than you are in the eternal destiny of your soul? Or have you truly repented of your sins, trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins? Are you submitting your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you living for your own pleasure? Is the choice that we are shown with Esau. It appears that Esau's tears were not for his sinfulness, but for his material loss. The realization that he had forfeited something of value which he couldn't recover. And we've got no evidence that he repented from his wrong course, made a right about face in his life. Esau, in making the decision to sell his birthright, did so of his own free will. Jacob and Esau as individuals were both free to choose their own course of action. And had Esau shown that he sincerely repented and wished to change his manner of life, God would have forgiven him. In Jesus' teaching, we hear very clearly this statement. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Yes, God will see our tears and our hearts. If we decide like Esau to do our own thing, we'll get to the stage where we cannot reach God, however hard we try. But if we truly repent, give our lives to God, he will change our lives, and one day all our tears will be removed from our eyes as we enter into his presence. What will you choose today? Amen.